and welcome to episode 15 of the Detours in Music podcast. Today we have an interview with Dr. Sonia Baker, professor of voice at James Madison University and previously the associate dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts at James Madison University. Hi, so I'm Sonia Baker. I'm a professor of music and voice at James Madison University. That's the role I serve right now and also a classical singer. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us about your start in music? Sure. So like a lot of kids, I sang in school choirs. Um, I did high school musical um, show choir and musicals. And at age 14, I said I thought I might want to take voice lessons. I got some advice that said that I should probably start piano lessons um, and that I should maybe wait till I was about 16 for voice, waiting for the, the instrument to mature a little bit. I should have started piano, but I told my mom, I won't practice that, yeah. so, <laughs> which was honest. Um, yeah. sure wish I'd had. <laughs> uh, so I started taking voice lessons when I was 16. Going into high school, when you started taking voice lessons, were you realizing, okay, this is something I want to do in college? Um, you know, I knew that I wanted to keep singing. And so I kept taking voice lessons. I went to Yale for college. I went thinking I was going to be a biology major. I had worked in a biology lab at Indiana University the summer before I went to college. Okay. And, um, and so then I, like, I joined the Yale uh, freshman chorus at that point and a female acapella group. So I was doing a bunch of singing, and then I also started taking voice lessons there, which um, at that level was with uh, graduate students in the School of Music. And all of that was extracurricular mm -hmm. while I was taking classes. Um, so I, I obviously was spending a bunch of time singing, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't necessarily thinking that, that, that it was a career path for me at that point. Okay. How far into your studies, I guess, did you get with biology or the other things? So biology, after my first year, I came home and said, no, that's not it. <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing that for three more years. Mm -hmm. And um, and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I had taken one American studies class that I really loved and said, well, I think I might want to try to do that. So mm -hmm. actually, I ended up switching my major to American studies with a concentration in cultural history. That is the degree that I have from Yale. I graduated with that degree, uh, BA degree. Yale was a great, great liberal arts. Mm -hmm. It's a great liberal arts school, so it's a great place to explore a lot of things. Um, and I just was singing all along. And so I took voice lessons with the grad students and got to my junior year. Actually, my sophomore year, I was in the Yale Glee Club. I went and auditioned for a small solo and landed a large solo. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe I should do this. Th oh, maybe I should do more of this singing. So my junior year, I was studying with a grad student in the School of Music who said, who was really, really great and helped me give my very first full recital. I gave a full recital in four languages, all an hour long, all for no curricular credit. Um, and then she also said, I think you should be studying with my voice teacher. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so she introduced me to Lily Chikazian, who was teaching in the School of Music. And that was my teacher for my last year of college. Um, and again, I'm still trucking along as an American Studies major, singing mm -hmm. in the Yogli Club, singing solos. Um, I gave another full recital my senior year of college but it was really the summer between my junior and senior year of college when when you say to yourself what am I doing when this is over because I'm mm -hmm. almost there uh I said oh my gosh I think I want to go to music school and in all this time I never really I never took the piano I should have taken mm -hmm. I never really learned how to read music but I I had sung a lot and I'd done a lot of stage work and I had pretty good language skills mm -hmm. and a, a really good ear that got me by on a lot of stuff. So it was in that in that senior year of college, I said, okay, I'm going to try to apply to music schools. Do you think it was having that um, professional teacher that really made the difference? Or was it just being, I guess, with lessons in general? Um, I, You know, I have to say, I have a lot of 
intrinsic motivation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it was really just sort of my personal drive. Okay. I would uh, I would find myself going over to the music library and there was an amazing librarian there when I would say, Hey, I'm looking for a recording of this song that I'm singing. And then I'd find a, maybe a singer that I really liked um, who was singing it. I'd say, Oh, can you give me some more Arlene Auger? Because I, I liked that. Right. <laughs> um, and you could actually go in and say, I'm just looking for a really good recording of Marriage of Figaro. And this guy would be like, do you want the best ensemble all around? Do you want the best conductor? Do you want the best soprano? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was amazing. And this was, believe it or not, how I spent free time, right? And mm -hmm. so I think that when I, I, I have an inner voice that I try to really listen to. Yeah. And I think that I, I just heard myself saying, wait, I'm thinking more of music than I am of other things. It's mm -hmm. pretty clear that this is what I should try to do. That makes sense. Um, after your time at Yale, where did that lead you in thinking you wanted to study music? So I applied to a bunch of different programs. Um, I, of course, couldn't go into a traditional master's program because I didn't have an undergraduate degree in music. Okay. And I didn't, the thing about it was I didn't even know anything. So yeah. I didn't feel like, oh gosh, I should, I mean, it was great in terms of going back and taking the tests for these programs and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to recall. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know anything. So yeah. And you don't um, know what you don't know. At yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I was, I was really fortunate. I went, I was accepted at Indiana University mm -hmm. and because the program is so large there mm -hmm. and both the undergraduate and graduate programs are, are housed in the same school of music. I was accepted. I completed all the core courses for an undergraduate music degree while I overlapped them with deficiency classes for a master's degree. So, oh, of class. <laughs> yeah, I t it took me three and a half years to mm -hmm. complete a master's degree at IU. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was great. Yeah. Um, I happened to have been a resident of the state of Indiana at the time. So I was also paying in-state tuition, which, which was amazing. Yeah. I got a graduate assistantship with a, the IU Soul Review, and I worked doing soul music, teaching music, that music to people and um yeah it was just a really good it was a good fit for me there were other places that were it would have been much more difficult for me to go were you focused on the idea of teaching music or performing definitely performing okay I, I had I mean also in high school so I said I was in musicals but I was in a lot of straight theater as well okay um and when I was an American studies major I really thought to myself I might end up in the nonprofit world of theater Mm -hmm. I worked with kids doing children's theater. Um, I did children's theater in in a school for at-risk kids for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had that performing itch. <laughs> After IU, I went back, actually, believe it or not, to Yale, <laughs> to the Yale School of Music, which is mm -hmm. separate from the department. At Yale, there isn't really a performing undergraduate degree, but in the School of Music, obviously, it's a very performing, performance-oriented. And they had just started an artist diploma program, which was the thing that you can only be in, at least there at the time, was after you finished a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And I went back to the teacher that I had as an undergraduate in my last year. <laughs> yeah, and she was great. But I found myself, the, I felt like the program in its first year wasn't well conceived. I was doing a lot of stuff that the master's degree students were. And um, and although they gave me some money, I was also taking out some loans for it. And I said, I, I don't need to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So I did the freelance thing for a while. Was really lucky that I got a teacher in New York City, a voice teacher in New York City that I adored. And... Um, as I was plowing along, not getting enough work as a singer, I, I started to get discouraged. And I had a friend who was a coach who said, I think you ought to go back to school. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I said, oh, gosh, Gary, I hate school almost as much as I hate singing right now. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I get it, but you, you're, you're doing the worst part, which is auditioning. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're the kind of singer who will get work from working 
probably not from your 10 minute audition, Mm -hmm. um, which turned out to be incredibly true, but also frustrating at the time. And um, so there I was freelancing, living in my parents' cabin in Woodstock, New York, uh, without my parents. Mm -hmm. So I was living rent free without my parents, which was amazing, um, (laughs) which was a gift, Mm -hmm. but also trying to trying to figure out how to make it. And so I said, well, I'll apply to programs that I think are really reputable and also have some money because I have none. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll see what 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 happens I wasn't sure I wanted to go back to school Mm -hmm. I I ended up getting accepted and getting a really nice fellowship at Florida State University okay and that's where I finished my doctoral work do you think if you hadn't been I guess encouraged to go back to school or to um find like your passion again with singing do you think that you would have maybe eventually steered off into something else I definitely would have. I was, um, so I mentioned doing the the children's theater work and I'd done a lot of work with children pretty consistently for about 10 years. So while I was freelancing before I went back to school, mm-hmm. I was also working in a mental health association, running self-help groups for kids. And I was really thinking to myself, what's the, what's the job for me in working with kids? I have a, I have this resume of mm-hmm. working with kids. And so um, how am I going to parlay that into my next move? That's definitely what, what I was thinking about at the same time that I was applying to graduate schools, trying to just trying to, you know, toss it all up in the air mm-hmm. and figure out what stuck, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you think now if you weren't a musician, you would be working at like a children's theater or running maybe a children's theater? Um, yes, or, or teaching kids something. (laughs) I have no idea what. I mean, I really do feel like I, I, I belong teaching. (laughs) In your master's degree, was there something you struggled with that maybe most undergrad students struggle with in music? Oh, yeah. So one of the things for me that was (laughs) incredible was that I, here I was with my Ivy League degree Mm -hmm. and I moved into a field that required study in a totally different way than Mm -hmm. I had been studying. So I was like, wow, well now, now what am I going to do? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to always study for my other classes with music on. And then all of a sudden I said, Oh wait, I can't can't do that. I have to listen to it. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's totally confusing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I also couldn't study with silence um, so it was hilarious. I went and bought like an uh, environmental sounds recording so that I could have the ocean waves and the dinghy in the background just because yeah. I couldn't have silence. But then in my head, I could also have the music that I was trying to study. Right. I could I could audiate what I needed to audiate. Yeah. Um, uh, so just learning new study skills mm-hmm. was, was I mean, and the, again, there you are with you're like, I've I've been a really successful student. And now I don't know how to study. How is this mm-hmm. possible? Mm-hmm. Um, and I had I also relied on a really good ear mm-hmm. for so long, but didn't know the the mechanics of music, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And yeah. I said, oh, there's a system? Mm-hmm. Cool, I can learn a system. Yeah. <laughs> Just nobody ever taught it to me, right? Um, so d- d- dictation was really hard for me. You know, like, oh, okay. The, all that stuff I've been hearing, I can translate to the page and, mm-hmm. and make that translate back to my ear. Huh. All right. Let me, let me sort through how that works. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do you advise or do you have advice for younger musicians who things aren't necessarily going as expected? Yeah, so I, I mean, I will often talk to students about, did you, do you think this is a, a vocation for you or not, right? Because um, for some people, they thought it was always just going to be as fun as high school ensemble was, right? And I, I always say music is a discipline, <laughs> just like other disciplines. And then it also requires discipline. Yeah. And some people don't, don't want music to be disciplined, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or this disciplined. 
as a yeah. as a music major. And so m- maybe it's not the thing that they actually want to study. Maybe they do just want to have a have a community choir experience mm-hmm. every week and have something else be their vocation, right? Yeah. Um, and I think you again like really have to listen to the inner voice and see it, it, where what do I really love. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that you have to embrace moving outside of your comfort zone mm-hmm. to be a really good artist. Yes. And is that is that the thing that's making it feel like oh this isn't this isn't what I want it to be? It's like mm-hmm. well, find a way to be comfortable with being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. (laughs) um because that that's part of artistic growth that's part of growing as a human being you know Mm -hmm. and um hopefully you'll try to step outside of your box often enough that it's not as scary to step outside of your box Mm -hmm. day after day but that, that takes a while to learn i mean i'll tell students look, do other things that are outside of your comfort zone so it doesn't seem as scary. Mm -hmm. And that could be walking to class a different way. That could be wearing makeup or not wearing makeup, depending on what you're used to doing, you know, Um, whatever it is. And you say, okay, I lived through that uncomfortable experience. Mm -hmm. I know how to deal with that feeling. And I'm going to deal with that feeling as an artist as well. Mm -hmm. I think for me, especially... I can relate to that where I am now is I feel like I'm close to like getting a lot better, but I'm also like very close to not getting better. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not just you practice more and then it'll, it'll happen. It's kind of like you have to intentionally choose to kind of be uncomfortable what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just often say that I think the learning process happens in leaps and plateaus mm-hmm. um, and sometimes you plateau out and then you're waiting for another one of those leaps. But the leap is sometimes a leap up and a, a leap up four steps and a leap back five steps. And, yeah. you know, then you got to live with that thing that feels. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think was your musical detour if you had to pick? <laughs> So I I feel a little like I had a lot of detours. <laughs> you can say more than one. <laughs> um, I would say just choosing music was a detour, right? Mm-hmm. It looked like I was on a totally different path when I went to college and then when I had a major that wasn't in music. So choosing music was a detour. Um, I, I also think that moving from um, after I graduated college, doing freelance work, thinking I was going to be a performer, and then going back to school to do a doctoral degree where you're thinking I might teach. Well, Mm -hmm. that's certainly a musical detour. Um, Mm -hmm. The the collegiate teaching world also allows and requires a performance career as well, but doesn't Mm -hmm. rely on that performance career in the same way. So you have a different balance of your your professional obligations. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I had another one when I moved into administration. Yeah. Um, I was in higher ed administration for 11 years. And that meant that for the first six, I was half time teaching and half time at being an associate assistant and associate dean. And then uh, doing some performing while I was doing that. But it, it, I, of course, had to scale back some of my performance Mm -hmm. and then when I came here as associate dean at JMU I scaled back my performance a great deal because the job was so all-consuming it's really really took a lot of time a lot of energy and I did what I could to maintain my instrument I did some performances but nothing like Mm -hmm. I was doing before somebody's People would often say, well, do you wish you were performing more? And I'd say, yes, but I don't know when. Yeah. <laughs> um, or even, I mean, even how I'd have the stamina for, mm-hmm. for major performances. I'd really have to build that back up. Mm-hmm. So th- that that was a bunch of detours. And now I, uh, in the last year, came back to teaching. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a detour again and trying to rebuild more of a performance career mm-hmm. uh, as a result. But um the thing that I didn't, the thing that was so hard for me in teaching was, I mean, in administration was not having enough contact with students. Mm-hmm. And and I've been singularly driven 
my entire higher ed career by students and what they need, what we, what I, I can do, offer to help them be flourishing, prosperous people in the world. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit more about what brought you to administration? Sure. Um, so my, my husband would say my wife is easily bored. <laughs> he may be right about that. <laughs> and I, I felt like I was looking for new challenges after, um, what did I had about 10 years of 10 years of teaching college level voice and I knew that I had another variety of skills, of leadership skills, um, other things that I wanted to offer. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in kind of the, and still am interested in the big picture of higher ed and what, what do we do, what can we do mm -hmm. to help young people become educated citizens, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was a job opening, I was at Murray State University at the time, which was a half-time assistant dean position. And I thought, well, I'll try it. Mm -hmm. right? um, I'll still be teaching. If I don't like it, I'll just go back to teaching full-time. And um, and I'll be able to sort of utilize a greater variety of skills. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would say that's really what, what drew me into it. That makes sense for sure. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm guessing that's how you came to JMU was for an administrative position. Yeah, so the, the job at JMU was the, a full-time administrative position. Mm -hmm. And I had an amazing opportunity to be a fellow with the American Council on Education, which is a fellowship that your president or chief academic officer at your institution have to nominate you for. Mm -hmm. President or chief academic officer at another institution serves as your primary mentor. Okay. And so you spend a bunch of time on another campus shadowing senior leadership to see how, how do the, what they would say is the 30,000 foot view, right? Mm -hmm. you see that and see how are those decisions made and how are, how are leaders processing, mm -hmm. um, you have to process at that level. Okay. And so once I did that, and I did that in part because I was trying to figure out, do I want a full-time administrative job? And how do these people have student contact? Because <laughs> I knew I didn't want to do the job if I didn't have student contact. Mm -hmm. um, and they do it in a variety of different ways. And I said, okay, I'll try it. So I ended up back at JMU because it was my a, a really great full-time mm -hmm. administrative job. Mm -hmm. When I started teaching at JMU, the School of Music was was not, there was no College of Visual and Performing Arts. Um, and the fact that the institution had this college that was focused just on the arts, mm -hmm. I could be part of that. And I, mm -hmm. I've always considered myself an interdisciplinarian. Mm -hmm. um, it, you can see from my background that I've been in so many different disciplines, yeah, definitely. right? Um, that I thought, oh, this is a, this is a, a great fit for me. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, in those detours of your life, um, how have you defined those moments, I guess, or realized that you're kind of at the crossroads, um, I guess, reflecting on that experience? Yeah, so, you know, it's funny, when I was in the ACE Fellows Program, we had, we had a lot of different stuff we did, but we had a small group that we would meet with when we had regular retreats. And mm -hmm. I remember saying at one point, in my small group, I've never been any place where I wasn't supposed to be at the time. I never mm -hmm. felt like I was any place where I wasn't supposed to be at the time. And I had a colleague that said, how is that possible? <laughs> and again, I said, I listen to my inner voice really carefully, mm -hmm. really carefully. And so what I would feel is just this restlessness right? Mm -hmm. Like, I can't keep doing this. I don't know what the other thing is, but I can't yeah. keep doing this. Um, and that's when I, that's when I start searching for what is the other thing. Mm -hmm. And then I also have to ask myself, what do I find myself thinking about wanting? How do I want to spend my time? I very intentionally try to have my actions follow my values, mm -hmm. speak my values. And so there are times when I say to myself, am I, what am I spending time on? Is that the thing I value? Mm -hmm. well, 
then maybe I need to do more of that thing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's part of how I, I, I try to sort out What's the next opportunity? I also kind of, I, I, I use my gut, right? I look at, I tell students when you're looking for a major, like look at the classes that are required and use your gut. Do, does it feel like, oh, I'd like to be in those classes or mm -hmm. oh, there are too many of those that don't appeal to me. I said, you gotta be honest. There, there are always gonna be classes that are less appealing to you than others. It's like yeah. job, right? There's always part of a job that's not great <laughs> that you're not eager to do, but it, that's, that's okay. That's life. <laughs> yeah. Is that kind of what's brought you back into teaching now? Is that your gut was saying you missed that aspect? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. And I just kept thinking, I, I, for me, every July was so difficult. Mm -hmm. Every July. I, I've said for years, they should just give me July off. <laughs> And I got to say, I think I'd be just as productive <laughs> because I'd look out and there'd be no students, there are no performances, there are no, like, why am I doing it? Why am I doing it? And in my last year in the administrative job, I also, there were so many signs that I should be singing more. <laughs> I mean, I, I literally had some physical ailments and I remember going to physical therapy and saying, well, how can I how can I manage this on my own? And they'd say things like, oh, breathing exercises are really helpful for this. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm trained in that, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, there just were so many signs that I, I wasn't I wasn't on the path I needed to be on exactly. And I just had to figure out what, what the next path was going to be. Yeah. Well, I would say that's very commendable that you <laughs> listen to your gut because that's something that I find difficult probably. <laughs> or it sounds difficult to be a professional doing well and then to decide to change something. Yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, but I also have to say there are a lot of shoulds in my life, right? And I beat myself up about a lot of shoulds, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, here we are in this strange time of all of a sudden being an online institution and mm -hmm. I feel like I should take advantage of all these online opportunities. I should, you know, and I said, wait, but you're not trained in that. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you beating yourself up? Because you, I mean, I'm spending hours trying to learn things. And every, I mean, really every professor in the country is doing the same thing. I'm not super special in this way because <laughs> we, we do want to do well by all yeah. of you. Right. But if we were super well trained in the online thing, we would have been doing it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time thinking I should do this. I, I should have had, I should have tried to move up in administration because, um, you know, there are not a lot of women. There are not a lot of African-Americans. There are really not a lot of African-American women. <laughs> and I should try to be a trailblazer and I should, and sometimes I think, oh, maybe I'll go back to it. Mm -hmm. um, I just knew it was a time when I wasn't, I wasn't happy in what I was doing and I had to find the, the next step. Right. Um, and there are also family considerations that you, th that you weigh in your decisions. And, um, and I find that I am happier if I do follow my gut mm -hmm. and not follow the shoulds. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes they're the same, yeah. but, but they're not always the same. But that's not to say that I don't beat myself up about the things I should do. Mm -hmm. I, I I actually texted with my brother yesterday because I was talking about the frustration with the online teaching. And, and he said, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. And I said, but I'm super good at that. That should be an Olympic sport and I'd get a medal. <laughs> yeah. so, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think you ought to think that I'm ma I've got some magic answer on that one. Yeah. Um, there's one of the like pictures going around Facebook I saw was like the teacher's angle of these online lessons and it's like cameras like a piano all these keyboards and then like the students was like just to stand <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I know. which I don't know if that's completely true but I'm I'm sure that the teacher side is more than <laughs> more than we see right yeah <laughs> I, I loved the Mozart quote that said it is a mistake to think that the practice of my art has become easy to me mm -hmm. <laughs> right 
Yeah. Uh, I say often that I think I decided to sing because it was the hardest thing I ever found to do, Mm -hmm. that it was physically, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally demanding all at the same time in a way that I, I, I often say, I think only being an athlete would be similar Mm -hmm. Um, that you have to, you really have to juggle all those balls Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Um, and especially since your in voice, your instrument is you. Yeah, <laughs> you. You carry it around with you every day. The weather's different every day. Impacts mm-hmm. your instrument. Right, it impacts your that that impacts your instrument too. <laughs> I know. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but I have to say the um, proliferation of the anybody can sing on TV reality show. Mm-hmm. certainly makes it seem like oh it's not work right mm-hmm. and I think to myself I, I did actually put in my 10,000 hours a long time ago <laughs> right and, that, yeah. and that's how you hone your craft mm-hmm. and so to think that it's that it, it's just easy that we'll all do what is on uh, American Idol it, yeah. it's flawed yeah. um, and to think that anybody can sing it is certainly flawed. I mean, my, my dad couldn't, mm-hmm. <laughs> couldn't. Yeah. Uh, and as, and as I age, my voice changes. Mm-hmm. And, and so trying to figure out like, what, what's this voice now? Mm-hmm. It's very different from the voice I had 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that, that, that's the evolution of the instrument. Yeah. And so it's, it's never gonna. It, it's never really gonna be easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that quote too. I just would say that a a, a detour in life is an opportunity, mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean that you failed in what you were doing before. It also doesn't mean that what you will do in the future is gonna necessarily be the better thing, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, it just might be that you, your journey is taking you in another direction for a while. And learning to come to terms with that one way or another, I think is, is an essential life skill. Mm-hmm. So I, I like your, I like your topic of musical mm-hmm. detours, because I think that, I think that all detours are, um, are, are significant and, mm-hmm and useful Mm -hmm. and just every choice just choices are interesting because even people who maybe don't look like they've had detours they've maybe the choice to not not have them was a detour I guess yeah definitely Mm -hmm. definitely um so what made you decide musical detours was your your topic for this capstone um mostly because um I'm kind of at that point (laughs) where I was like, I feel like there are really high expectations of what I do next. And there's like a precedent of, you know, where I'm supposed to go to school next and all the goals. And not that I don't have those goals, but it's like almost to feel better about, (laughs) about the outlook. It's like, if I don't get into the top school, like, am I bad? You know, like, right. And hearing more about other people, I've always liked knowing <laughs> about people's lives. Um, and just people are surprising and everyone's paths are surprising. I think 90% of the interviews, people weren't music majors when they started <laughs> college or they weren't com- just music majors. Um, so it's just, it's nice to hear from the people I look up to and I know a lot of people would deem as successful and professional. It's like, okay, yes, there is a cookie cutter way to do things, but you don't have to do that in order to be like successful or happy or, um, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that again, like the, the big detour for me was before my senior year of college and like sorting out that senior year of college. Right. And so that's, yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) 
so there I was at Indiana University with, you know, people who had been musicians since they were four, right? Mm -hmm. And knew that that's exactly what they wanted to do. And I always felt like I was a, a bit of a poser, <laughs> right? I was like, yeah. why am I here? How am I going to do it? These are real musicians. I'm not a real musician. And mm -hmm. I went through that so much. And I remember um, a, a professor there who actually happened to just be the father of a friend of mine mm -hmm. who said, you know, some, those people that spend all their time in a practice room, they don't actually have anything to say, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right? Like it's important to practice, but it's important to be out in the world and ex observe the world so that you have something to say as an artist. And he said, exactly. you've got that, Sonia. You've got something else that some of those people don't have and you're bringing that to the table. And now you're going to have to spend some time in the practice room to get mm -hmm. to where they are, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it can give us all a lot of perspective if we have tried kind of something else um like for me going into JMU I was double major just because I wasn't like ready to say that I was committed to this you know yeah. um which I think a lot of people go through and now I feel better because it's like no I I realize like this is like what I at least for now want to do <laughs> yeah well I also love that you say this is what I want to do for now <laughs> no yeah. knowing that things yeah change. Yeah, I had a colleague I worked with at Murray State who um, I said it was really good when we would go out on a recruiting trip together because he's he was the kind of guy that had the eight year plan, mm -hmm. right? He'd have this idea of like how the next eight years would go. Now he would he would confess that it never turned out exactly like that, mm -hmm. but he would have that kind of plan. Yeah, and I said I. I'm lucky if I've got the eight minute plan, but what I'm trying to do is acquire skills so that when a door opens, I can, I can make the choice to walk through or not walk through. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. I'm just like constantly trying to acquire skills. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, you can do it any number of different ways. I hope you all enjoyed that interview and conversation that I had with Dr. Baker Doing interviews over Skype has been definitely a different transition for me, but I think it's becoming more comfortable over time. And as always, follow the podcast on YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Music podcast apps, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.